Hello my fellow whale watchers and welcome to the second part of Fundamentals of Hangar Development. This is another episode of War Robots Basics where I speak about principles of the game that may be especially interesting for newer players. Let me thank you at this point for the overwhelming positive feedback that I got after the first video. This shows me that there is an interest in such videos and I may produce more of them in the future. Again, your feedback is very welcome. In the first part, we looked into a practical and strategic approach on how you can develop your War Robots Hangar from zero. In case you missed it, you can find a link in the description of this video. It's for sure helpful if you have watched part 1 before. In today's video, we are going to elaborate on this concept in a bit more detail and focus on the basic items that you can upgrade for silver. The most basic items that you can build and upgrade are robots and weapons. As a rule of thumb, your weapons should always be at least one, but better two or more levels higher than your robots. So for example, if you have an MK1 level 7 Scorpion, your weapons should be at least at level 9. Why is that? Well, for answering these questions, it's always best to think about the extremes first. Imagine that you have an MK1 level 1 Scorpion with MK3 weapons. If it's played conservatively and carefully, this can be a beast. It is an extreme example of a glass cannon, but it can take out entire robots. And it's the same for example for a Hawk with HMGs, a Prisma Erebus or a Puncher Orochi. So now compare this to an MK3 Scorpion with MK1 level 1 weapons. Well, it will definitely survive longer, but you will bring in close to zero damage. So in general that's much worse I would say. The exception to the rule is some heavy tanks that define themselves almost entirely through their tankiness. If you run a traditionalist Falcon or a Skyros with bad weapons for example, they can still make a significant impact on the battlefield, because their main purpose is to have health, lock down beacons and bind opponents. But for everything else, the best compromise between these two extremes with regard to balanced performance on the battlefield is that you have weapons that are some two levels higher than the robot that you run them on. And this requires some discipline. If you have a Blitz, it's quite easy to level up the Blitz from level 6 to level 7. But it's much much harder, more expensive and more time consuming to level up 4 light weapons from level 8 to level 9. And that brings me to the next topic which is the cost of weapon upgrades. Be very very careful if you choose to upgrade more than 2 or 3 weapons of the same type. Because it can be a very costly mistake if you do so. Imagine if you had let's say again a Blitz in early 2022 and through chest opening luck you happen to get 4 snare weapons. Back then the new lighting weapons were great. They could toast pretty much everything from 600 meters, they were meta. So what can potentially go wrong, right? Well, guess what? Big Sonic nerfed them, and after the nerf they pretty much became useless. So imagine how somebody must have felt they just spent 2 months and hundreds of millions of silver to bring all 4 of these weapons to MK112. It could have been better to max, let's say, only 2 of them, and max for example 2 Magnetars instead of the other 2. The Magnetars were buffed, they also have 600 meter range, provide lockdown, in the aftermath you are always wiser, right? But let's say experienced players of this game would have seen that coming, because it has always been like this. New OP items get introduced, old items tend to get nerfed and items that not many players run tend to get buffed. So there is a system behind. Unfortunately that's not the only system in place. Pixonic has set up newer weapon systems like HMGs and blast shotguns in a way that they don't work together well with other weapon types. Is this just coincidence? I don't think so, but again, that's the way the game is set up these days. So let's come to the most underestimated type of item in the game, passive modules. For most newer robots, two module slots are unlocked when they reach MK1 level 7, and three passive module slots are unlocked at MK1 level 9. So these levels are quite important milestones for your robot. In Master League, for example, you can find a lot of players that have MK1 level 9 hangers and weapons that are between level 10 and 12. These are usually very balanced hangers in terms of performance and it indicates that the players somehow understood what they are doing. The thing that makes passive modules so valuable is that they can be transferred from one robot to another. Unlike Titan module slots, passive module slots are all the same. So if you level up a module, you will benefit from it for a very long time. And this is the reason why you should put these up in your priority list, right after weapons and robots. In my hangar reviews, the most common mistake that I see is that players neglect passive module development. But that leaves them at considerable disadvantage compared to their peers. If you run a Fenrir with standard level 1 damage and durability modules, and you run into another Fenrir with developed tier 4 modules, you will simply lose the duel, big time. Robot and weapon levels actually just tell half the story of how competitive a build is. These days, fights are usually decided by secondary gear. 
A very good source for getting reasonable modules for cheap apart from van chests are black market silver chests. Also in the shop you can purchase quite reasonable modules for gold, but usually they are quite expensive. But as soon as you can get your hands on them, you should max them out as soon as you can. Here you can find a few of the most useful T3 and T4 modules for each roll, but keep in mind this may not be up to date anymore at the point when you watch this video. As for other secondary gear, there is a basic rule. Modules should always emphasize the strength of a particular robot. So if you develop modules for tanks for example, they should increase the tank's durability. And if you develop modules for mid support damage dealers, they should increase damage, as they won't necessarily need more durability in their role. Now let's quickly look at active modules. Every active module has a value for certain types of builds, but the two most common active modules that you can see on the battlefield these days are the repair unit and the advanced repair unit. And there are a few reasons for it. Of course, the main one is the self-healing effect after you have been hit, which simply prolongs your life. But keep in mind that the effect is active for certain durations, so you can also use the modules for counter healing, for example when you get out of cover for shooting your opponents for a few seconds. In higher leagues, healing modules are often used for damage amplification. Certain drone microchips use the healing module as a trigger in order to temporarily increase damage up to 70% for a few seconds. Did you ever wonder why you seem to die so quickly when you run into a top layer build? Well, this may answer your question. One of the most complicated things to understand in war robots are cross correlations between one type of gear that affect other types of gear. Another example is the glider drone that heals up after you trigger a particular active module, in that case phase shift. So in short, if you don't know too much about active modules and cross correlations, just put the repair unit on your robot, basically you can never be wrong with that. And if you run a behemoth or a rajin, just for the sake of it, put a jumping unit on it for a day. It looks ridiculous and it is ridiculous. One remark on silver gear in general. If you are a free to play player or on a very low budget, I would strongly suggest you to only upgrade your silver gear during upgrade super drive events. When I made this video in August 2022, these events that provide minus 40% on all silver upgrades happen quite frequently. In long terms you save a lot of silver. And if you happen not to play on the Steam platform, you can also watch a few ads for accelerating upgrade times and launch multiple upgrades during the time window when the event is active. I recently released a tutorial on how to do that best. You can also find the link to it below in this video's description. So in the end of this video, let's do some Q&A. A subscriber asked me recently if it can make sense to only run robots with one type of weapon slots because he wanted to save silver in long terms. Well, it's not a bad idea, so I would definitely go for heavy weapon slots then because upgrading these is most cost effective. But keep in mind that first of all, you may not get the robots that you want. And you may also miss out on the current meta. Imagine you have a Typhon, two leeches and two Ravanas. Congrats, you only need medium weapons. But at the same time, you will get toasted by your opponents that only run Capris. So it may work quite well in lower leagues, but you may miss a bit of competitiveness as a result when you enter high level master league. A question that I sometimes get is, should you buy silver with gold? The answer is absolutely not. The exchange rate is one of the worst ones in the game, just don't do it. Another common question is, should you sell your unused gear in order to get silver? The answer is maybe, but I would recommend you to only sell gear if you are drowning in items of the same kind. But don't sell your only hammer weapon just because you don't have a second one for your Orochi yet. And if you can, resist the urge to sell your upgraded gear, because you only get back a fraction of what you spent, and keep in mind that they can become very valuable in the future again, for example if Pixonic chooses to buff them, or if you need to run certain types of builds for event tasks. Another question that floats around frequently, which gear should you build in a workshop? In my opinion, try to avoid building stuff in the workshop in general, because first of all you can never build the latest stuff there, also it's very expensive and time consuming. So I would only build something in a workshop that you would need in order to complete a very powerful build. For example, if you have a Ravana and two Havocs, and all you need is a third Havoc, go for it. Here is a short list of items that I found most useful to build in a workshop when this video was made in August 2022, but in general, try to avoid it if possible, it just eats your silver. By the way, other things that you can sell for silver in case you don't know, all kinds of components, pilots, titan gear and also paint jobs. So that concludes the second part of fundamentals of hangar development. I hope that you found this video a bit useful. Again, thanks a lot for watching and listening and see you on my channel.